This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 31, Coordinate Systems. Our objectives for this lecture are to understand the definition of coordinates and coordinate vectors. Given a basis B for a subspace H and a vector X in H, find the coordinate vector X sub B, and given a coordinate vector, compute the vector. So let's start by recalling the definition of basis from the previous lecture. When we have a subspace H of Rn, a basis is a set of vectors B1 through Bp that has these two properties. The set is linearly independent, and the set is a spanning set for H, or in other words, when we form the span of the B vectors, we get H. Now why is it important to have a basis for a subspace? Well, one advantage of a basis is that any vector in that subspace can be written as a linear combination of the basis vectors in only one way. And this theorem says exactly that. If H is a subspace of Rn, and script B is a basis for H, and X is a vector in H, then there are unique scalars, C1 through Cp, for which X can be written as a linear combination of the B vectors, with the Cs as the weights in that linear combination. And those unique scalars are called the coordinates of X relative to the basis B. So let's walk through the proof of this theorem. So we'll start with the setup of the theorem, where we have a subspace of Rn, script B containing the vectors B1 through Bp being a basis for H, and X being a generic vector in H. Now since we know that B is a basis for H, one of the things we know about B is that it spans H, which means that every vector in H can be written in some way as a linear combination of the B vectors. So let's do that. Let's let the scalars C1 through Cp be the scalars that we can use to write X as a linear combination of the B vectors. So the question this theorem is trying to answer is whether we can do that in a different way. Is there another group of scalars, D1 through Dp, for which X can also be written as a linear combination of the B vectors with the Ds as the weights? So this gives us two different ways to write X. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna subtract these two equations. On the left-hand side, we get X minus X, which is the zero vector. And on the right-hand side, I'm gonna group the scalars for each vector. So C1, B1 minus D1, B1, I'm going to group those together and write that as C1 minus D1, parentheses, times B1, and so on. And so what this gives us is a linear combination of the B vectors that equals the zero vector. But the other thing we know about the B vectors is that they're linearly independent. And so by the definition of linear independence, any linear combination of the B vectors that equals the zero vector must have zero weights. And so C1 minus D1 equals zero, C2 minus D2 equals zero, all of those weights in this linear combination must equal zero. And so if I add D1 to both sides of the first equation, I get C1 equals D1. Add D2 to both sides of the second equation, I get C2 equals D2, and so on. So the Cs equal the Ds, and that proves the uniqueness. That proves that there's no different way to write X as a linear combination of the B vectors. And this tells us that coordinates are unique. So remember our definition from before, when we write X as a linear combination of the B vectors, the weights are the coordinates of X relative to that basis B. Now sometimes it'll be convenient to write those coordinates as a single vector. So the notation X in brackets with a subscript B is the vector that contains the C coordinates. Notice here that the coordinate vector has P entries, even though X itself has N entries. So the number of entries in the coordinate vector is equal to the size of the basis, whereas the vector itself might have a different number of entries. Okay, let's work through an example. So here we have two vectors, v1 and v2. We write script B for the set containing v1 and v2, and we let H be the span of B. So first, before we get into coordinates, let's refresh our memory for how we talk about basis from the previous lecture. Let's explain why script B is a basis for H. So remember that means two things. It means that script B is a linearly independent set, and it means that script B spans H. So to show that the set is a spanning set for H, that's given to us, right? We're told that H is the span of B, and so number two there, B spanning H, that's trivial. They told us that. For number one, script B being a linearly independent set, we see that B has two vectors in it, and one of the things that we learned back in lecture 16 is that when we have a set of two vectors, we can easily tell that it's linearly independent by checking to see whether the two vectors are multiples of each other. So if we try to set the first vector equal to a scalar multiple of the second vector, we might notice that in the second entry, this would give us that negative two equals a scalar times zero, but any scalar times zero would be zero, and since negative two does not equal zero, there's no way to make these vectors scalar multiples of each other. So that shows that script B is a basis for H. 
So now that we have a basis, we can talk about coordinates. So let's let u be the vector 5, negative 4, 18, and let's find the coordinates of u relative to the basis b. So what we're looking for are scalars c1 and c2, where when we multiply c1 times v1 plus c2 times v2, we get u. So this is asking us to solve a vector equation. And we know how to do that. We'll set up and row reduce an augmented matrix, and this gives us the solution c1 equals 2 and c2 equals negative 3. But we're looking for a coordinate vector, so that's just asking us to take these coordinates and put them into a vector. So u subscript b is the vector 2, negative 3. And again, notice here that u itself is a vector in R3, so u has three entries, but u sub b has two entries because the basis has two vectors in it. So just keep in mind that the coordinate vector and the vector itself might have a different number of entries. So what's going on here? What does this actually mean? Well, the subspace that we were talking about in example one is a plane in R3, and you see that pictured here with the vectors v1 and v2. So v1 and v2 span h, which means that every vector in h can be written as a linear combination of v1 and v2. But these two vectors define a grid on this plane, where the intersections in our grid represent vectors in h that have integer coordinates. So this is kind of like a skewed version of our normal grid that we use in the regular xy plane. And so I can graph the vector u here by plotting it at the point 2, negative 3 on this grid. Now it would be more convenient to have basis vectors that are equal length that are at right angles to each other, so that we didn't have this skewed grid, we just had a regular rectangular grid like what we're used to in the xy plane. And we're going to learn how to do that using the Gram-Schmidt process in lecture 40. Another thing to notice here is that the correspondence between the vectors and their coordinates is a linear transformation that happens to be one-to-one -one and onto. We won't go through the proof of that here, but that does turn out to be true. And any linear transformation that's one-to-one -one and onto is called an isomorphism. And isomorphisms are extremely important in linear algebra and other related areas of study, and we'll talk about this isomorphism and why that's important a little bit later on in a future lecture. Let's do some more examples. So here we have three vectors, u1, u2, and u3. We let script b equal u1, u2, and u3, and we want to prove that that's a basis for R3, and then we want to compute a coordinate vector for this vector 3, negative 1, 5. Let's start with number 1. So just like before, what do we do to prove that B is a basis for R3? Well, we can form the matrix whose columns are U1, U2, and U3, and row reduce it. Since we get a pivot in every row, that shows us by the spanning columns theorem that these vectors span R3. Since we have a pivot in every column, by the linearly independent columns theorem, these vectors are linearly independent. And that shows that B is a basis for R3. Notice that the process here is a little bit different than how we proved that our set was a basis in the previous example, because this time we're talking about R3 rather than a subspace. For number two, to find the coordinates of this vector, we have to solve the equation x1u1 plus x2u2 plus x3u3 equals w. We know that w can be written as a linear combination of the u vectors, and we're looking for the weights, so we solve this equation to find those weights. We set up and row reduce our augmented matrix, and we get the solution x1 equals 1 half, x2 equals negative 1, and x3 equals negative 3 halves. And then the coordinate vector is just the vector that has those coordinates as its entries, so w sub b is 1 half, negative 1, negative 3 halves. Let's look at this example. So again we have three vectors, we'll call them t1, t2, and t3, and we want h to be the span of those t vectors. Let's start with number 1. Does b span h? Well, just like in example one, that's trivial because that's given to us that h is the span of b. And now why are these vectors linearly independent? Well, since there's three vectors, we can't just look at whether they are multiples of each other. We have to actually use the linearly independent columns theorem. Setting up and row reducing the matrix that has these vectors as its columns, we see that there's a pivot in every column, and that means that these vectors are linearly independent. And so that shows that b is a basis for h. All right, what about problem number two here? Well, just like in the previous example, we have to solve the equation x1t1 plus x2t2 plus x3t3 equals y. We set up and row reduce an augmented matrix, and we get the solution x1 equals 3 halves, x2 equals negative 1 half, and x3 equals 1, which means that my coordinate vector is 3 halves, negative 1 half, 1. Let's keep going with this example, so same definitions from the previous slide. If z is the vector 1, 2, 3, 4, let's compute the coordinates of z relative to the basis b. So just like in number two, we set up our vector equation, x1t1 plus x2t2 plus x3t3 equals z. We set up and row reduce an augmented matrix, 
but this time we get a pivot in the last column. That would tell us that this vector equation has no solution. So what's going on here? What's happening? We proved a theorem that said that every vector in H can uniquely be written as a linear combination of the basis vectors. And so the only way to resolve this is to realize that this is telling us that that vector z is not in H. z can't be written as a linear combination of the t vectors because z isn't in the subspace. So if this ever happens to you, first double check that you didn't copy the problem wrong or make some sort of mistake, but then realize that what this is telling you is that the vector you're looking at is not in your subspace. Finally, let's look at number four here. So in this problem, we are given the coordinate vector for a vector, and we want to try to find the vector itself. So this is sort of backwards from what we've been doing. So let's think about what this is telling us. If we're given the coordinates for w, that's giving us the weights for w as a linear combination of the t vectors, which means that w equals 4t1 plus negative 1t2 plus 7t3. And we know t1, t2, and t3. They were on the previous slide, but we know those. And so all we need to do is compute that linear combination. Now we can save a little bit of time by multiplying the matrix whose columns are the t vectors times the vector 4, negative 1, 7, or you can just do the linear combination either way. But that tells us that w is the vector negative 10, negative 19, negative 1, 5. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.